Hi everyone, um, thanks for joining me. I'm gonna be the last person before lunch, so I'll try not to be too boring. Um, so today I wanna talk about what my life has been like for the past year. Um, you know, I call it a, a story. <laughs> and I hope to just give some insight about um, what I've been up to and uh, some of the things that you should probably be aware of and uh, some of the key takeaways if you haven't been paying for the attention. So uh, myself, I'm Cliff Perry. Uh, you can find me on Freenode in several channels actually, but those three, I'm there all the time. And because I work from home, I use a very boring nick. <laughs> um, so the agenda for today, an introduction, I'm gonna talk about the team uh, who I work with. I do work for Red Hat. I do have lots of privileged information because I work in the product security team and nothing here today is gonna be private. It's all public information. So, hey, <laughs> sorry to burst any bubbles there. Um, and I want to talk about the Meltdown Spectre and the events that followed. Um, give a brief overview of what they are. This isn't intended to be a technical session though. So there's lots of information out there, but a rundown of what they were and how to respond. And talk about how did Red Hat respond? What did we do? Um, and you know how and then what those artifacts were and the response and give some general conclusions at the end and I'll be happy to take questions on almost any topic um, including um, Emacs though I'm not an Emacs user but I did actually enjoy that presentation um, I originally started off with um, Nano and Pico and then I went to Z uh, Vim <laughs> So myself, um, I am an engineering manager. I work at Red Hat in the product security team. I've been um, working in the industry for about 20 years now. I spent a lot of time at Rackspace and then 15 years now at Red Hat. Um, I've done a lot in regards to systems management. I try not to take myself too seriously. Um, you know, I get enough of that at work. So when I'm not at work, I try to relax. <laughs> um, and my role though is in product security for the last three years and I work in a global team. I work with people who are program managers, um, assurance people, as well as security engineers who actually work on analyzing these issues and understanding what they are and their impact to our customers. And I worry about roughly half of Red Hat's portfolio, um, mostly the RHEL products and management products they use. Um, and so when we had these issues, they came underneath me. <laughs> and I was one of the people helping to coordinate um, our response. So as I said, I work in the product security team. Um, this is our vision. I hate reading, so I'm not gonna read that slide. But what does it mean? Really to me, it means that um, we care about ensuring that we have quality information given to our customers and we release that information in multiple manners, um, different types of data for the CVE pages and the ways you can consume it. Um, it's open, accessible, and that any of the additional content that we release is also likewise open and accessible, not only to our customers, but to anyone and everyone. Um, a lot of material released this year. Anyone can use it, it's not behind our paywall. It's publicly available information and we're often cited by the technical press communities as Red Hat stated this, um, using our material as well. Um, and we do want to protect our customers from the risks that are out there and tell them what are the meaningful things they need to worry about. Um, the team itself, we are a fairly large team. We're not a traditional product security um, incident response team. Uh, we do actually have other functions in our team as well. So we have the traditional uh, uh, learn about security issues, we triage them, we analyze them, we work with engineering, QE, release management, um, get the issues um, through the systems and out to our customers, uh, including the various um, yeah, CVE pages and metadata about the issues. We have a team that's called Assurance uh, that is a team of program managers who help coordinate internal to our customers, our product customers, 
and saying that how do you respond? Are you doing good governance for your products and making sure that they are meeting our standards and expectations for what we release? Um, data security and privacy is a fairly new team in our um, organization. Uh, we've been obviously with GDPR is one of the big ones, um, <laughs> but we actually have that team who ensure that the information released on the redhat.com slash trust um, is accurate, but also that we have the processes internally to be able to respond to any requests that uh, come down um, made from our customers or you know, anyone. <laughs> and the last part is uh, tooling. Uh, we actually have a dedicated DevOps team who create our internal tools that we use to shuffle things along and um, create various um, insight rules that are used to help give information to our customers about Oh, we see you running this system. Um, if you did this change, you'll help mitigate this problem or this potential concern. So we help to create those rules as well uh, for our customers. Okay, <coughs> so don't want to talk too much. The thing that's uh, kept me awake for the last year. Uh, no, I have slept. <laughs> um, so about I don't know, this time last year, um, Red Hat became aware of a fairly big thing. And we started working with um, Intel under embargo. And the net effect was very early in this year. Um, the it was released that there was a brand new class of computer issues. Um, I think everyone would agree that there was quite a lot of speculation about the weeks or so beforehand. Uh, we saw some interesting tech articles go out and um, other sources of information. So uh, I think it's right to recognize that Intel releases a week early. And what was interesting for me is that this was very big. Uh, it affected pretty much every single microprocessor out there. Uh, you know, if someone had access to your machine, they could read from the CPU data that should have been privileged and not access to them. And um, yeah, no one, no one had an easy solution. This was complex, it was large, and it was very well, fairly well coordinated, um, I think, in the end. And we got better over the year. So obviously Meltdown Spectre was the first, but there's been multiple issues come up over this year. And these six CVEs are just well, six of the many that we tackled over that same time frame. This, does it show up well? Oh, it does actually. I was afraid the text was too small, but the um, this is the timeline. Uh, obviously there is the main ones that everyone is aware of, but there've been multiple drops throughout the year of different issues coming out. And so after Meltdown Spectre, we became aware through Intel, through embargo process, of others coming out and we worked with them to ensure that the fixes were correct, uh, they were sent upstream, and then we worked with uh, peer vendors to make sure that we had our patches in order to get released in a timely manner. Um, and so this lasted up until August. The last one to come out was L1TF, and that was um, pretty invasive, and I'm going to have a slide on that at the end as well. So why did uh, this all happen? Um, what is Meltdown Spectre? I'm going to try to use an analogy. It's <coughs> simplified, but it, it gives the idea over. So I, I come into the, uh, my diner every day at 7 a.m. and I order pancakes and a coffee. I do this every day for a year. The cook knows this pattern, expects it, and so every morning just before 7 o'clock he's cooking the pancakes ready for me to come in. But what happens if I come in one day and I say, well, I don't want a pancake, I want some um, bacon and sausages today. Well, he's gonna have to take the pancakes, throw it away, and uh, cook what I ordered. And that is the easy part of what's happening in the CPU. It is it doing some speculation, it, it knows what it to expect. Some of these issues was training the branch predictor to predict in a certain manner. 
and um, yeah, and then at the end, so <coughs> so that's what the CP is doing. But then you're kind of looking at why does that matter? Why well, it mattered because we could actually use methods to look at what a CP is doing and gain access to data that we shouldn't have actually had data access to. And so this is all about the CPU doing things that wasn't well that normal people would not expect the CPU to be doing, and I was being able to find ways to gain access to that data. So these called the Brown prediction um, to speculate uh, lo along with speculative execution to of code to try to figure out and be as efficient as possible, um, uh, which is great until you know people figure out how way to get access to that data that they shouldn't have done. Uh, so I'm going to go over a bit about the actual issues. Again, I didn't want to be a technical session, so these slides will have more data than I'm going to say on it. Uh, the first ones were Spectre Meltdown. Um, both were abusing the uh, speculative ex execution. And um, once you've caused for melt Spectre, you, know, you had control over speculative execution and branch prediction to force data onto the CPU that you can then read out. Um, a meltdown was about data being in, in a wild cache that was being, um, that people were gaining access to before permission checks were happening. And the Red Hat published uh, uh, technical articles that have a lot of information, including ways to mitigate um, on that. So this, these were, yeah, they were pretty bad. They impacted, to some extent, all CPUs out there. Um, there were a few exceptions. I'm not going to mention them because, for the most part, they weren't what we worried about. There were some out there, though. They didn't need to worry. Um, all operating systems, because it was a hardware issue, the operating systems had to <coughs> react and provide mitigations, working with the um, CPU vendors to resolve this issue. Um, and then it was not just the physical machines, but containerized or virtualized machines. You know, c you can see what's happening outside that restriction. And initially, these with mitigations were quite um, resource intense um, hits. You know, it if we say thirty to up to thirty percent, depending on what your workload was like, if you applied the fixes straight away. And this was kernel virtualization, CPU microcode. And so you had to understand what was going on uh, to apply the things in the right places and in the right order, um, which included like actually rebooting your VM um, hosts. And uh, so that pretty bad 30% was, um, to the most part, reduced or gone with the introduction to uh, trampolines or rectolines um, that Google released and gave to the public in was it February, late January, February, and it took a little bit to um, get into our products as well. But that was great. Uh, Google had been working that, and they weren't ready before the embargo broke. So as soon as they was done, uh, we everyone started adopting it. Um, so, obviously, Meldon Spectre, what do I do? Well, apply all the fixes, <laughs> and including in multiple places. And now, though, it's kernel and microcode. So, the next issue was pop SS. And that was a s an interesting issue in that it was about moving instructions. And uh, it wasn't as huge deal, but it was still one that came out. Uh, we tried to explain it to our customers and why they should or should not worry about it and what use cases to be concerned with. Again, uh, apply patches. There was really very few issues this year that had a, oh, if you did this thing, that would help mitigate. It was always, you need to apply the vendor patches that came out. Uh, Spectre store bypass, a bit more interesting because this was looking at ways that possibly um, web browsers or Java 
um, type environments could also gain access to privileged information that shouldn't have. Um, I believe at the time a lot of the uh, like Chrome Mozilla they changed some settings in them so that they weren't as accurate in their own timers to make this much harder to um, execute. And again, applying uh, fixes that got released. A lazy FPU is another interesting one in the sense that it was uh, the floating point um, unit that was being used in this case and routines and that was only Intel that had this issue come out. We rated it as a moderate, we didn't consider it a huge impact um, but it was still there and we tried to explain it for our customers. Um, I should also say a lot of this stuff um, we had to respond because of our expectations that perhaps another people were going to talk about this and we know security research is reason so we need to tell our customers what the issue is and why or how you should respond appropriately. Uh, so we had to spend time taking an understanding, provide the solutions and give them enough information so they can perform a risk assessment. Um, and this one was apply kernel patches. And this was another uh, variant of uh, Spectre. Again, this only affected the Intel CPUs. So I suspect by now you've probably gone, I didn't hear about this, I didn't hear about this, which is great in a way, um, but that's why I'm not trying to spend too much time. This information is out there, it's public, um, but this is a lot of information we had to tackle over the year of what is this issue and why do I care? Or how shall I respond? Um, and for us, again, we had the microcode um, and kernel updates. Uh, we worked with um, Intel for the microcode. And the last one, though, um, is probably more the, low th the most worrying that maybe came out um, after Spectre meltdown. And uh, most worrying because this also impacted uh, your virtualized guests, your um, host machines, uh, as soon as someone had access onto the myth that system, they could gain access to privilege information. And uh, it was hard to describe what was going on and how to provide the mitigation. Um, there was actually three issues. Initially, it was reported as just the Intel SGX, in, uh, Secure Enclave. Um, during an analysis, an analysis of it, um, Intel discovered other variations of that and worked with the vendors to get those resolved and then coordinated as such. Um, and for L1TF, the uh, problem is that to be fully mitigated, you had to disable um, hyperthreading in the um, Intel CPU, which obviously is a, a pretty big deal, um, though for most customers that is not something they had to initiate. Uh, it depends on your environment and your workload. And so we had to create content that described the issue and try to say uh, if you're, you know, what is your risk profile and what the environments are. And uh, I, with this one, again, this is, um, if you didn't accept, or if you didn't want to have uh, full exposure, then the obviously resolution was we applied the system updates to your kernel, uh, virtualization, microcode that came out, and you can then look at the kernel parameters to um, switch on and off certain flags. And so, I tried very briefly to describe the, um, the technical issues, and I've kind of gone into a little bit as well also about how did we respond and why. And for us, I read uh, the product security team, we have a, an established process <coughs> in general for uh, security events. Uh, we are part of um, several uh, groups that handle s embargoed information. There's a Linux kind of security mailing list, there is um, a a distros, a, a vendor list as well and for most general disclosure processes. Um, 
and we um, are good citizens in that. Uh, we participate, we give feedback, we work with uh, uh, SUSE, uh, Ubuntu, and other vendors under the embargo processes as needed, um, including the upstream kernel maintainers. Um, and we, if we get told, or if we find out, we find out about an issue, we work with the appropriate vendor or reporter on how long they're going to keep it private and what timeframes are, as well as providing our own technical resources to make sure that we understand the issue, we have the fix. But also, sometimes we will um, you know, we'll tell people, you missed this use case as well, um, you know, as we do our own investigations and help polish things. And when we have these very high profile I issues, we have a established process that is, we call it a seesaw event. Um, uh, this graphic, does it, it kind of works. Uh, but it, it's, you know, our normal process is very much, we understand the security issue, uh, we triage it, we work with engineering to get it resolved in some time frame. With these events, we are looking at, okay, we recognize that there is something going to happen that makes it of customer interest. Of, of We should be telling our customers, hey, you want to pay attention to this. Um, and it helping to explain to our customers why that is the case. Uh, to get to that point, though, we have a lot of things that happened beforehand. <laughs> uh, so we have the normal engineering work. Um, but we also then work with um, partners in pr uh, customer support teams to create uh, material, uh, our stage press content as well with uh, marketing. We're creating technical articles. Uh, we're trying to understand how much of this technical article really, uh, what type of technical content do we need in this? Um, do we need a one page thing or do we need multiple articles going into various um, variations on this. Uh, for Spectre Meltdown, we had a main landing page, then we had multiple technical articles hanging off it for how does this impact me if I'm running um, other products or virtual uh, rev, um, satellites, uh, uh, OpenStack, um, and these other types of environments and deployments. How do I ensure that my, not only is my Red Hat RHEL system patch, but also how does that flow through the rest of my portfolio or what I'm using? Um, and, you know, obviously at the end of the process, we have the packages tested and QE'd and you know, go through various cycles. Uh, we stage everything and we then look to release on day release. I think, if I'm honest, um, with Spectrum Elder, they went out on January the 3rd. It was a week early. We were very lucky in that we had most of our stuff ready. Um, and so we found out Intel was going to release this. Uh, we had a, a private call with them. And they said, oh, yeah, you've got three hours. Um, so that's a, kind of the mad dash. The mad dash to go, oh, really? OK. Um, so that's like, you know, I knew that at that point, that was 5 PM. I was like, I'm not going to bed early tonight. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, so as soon as we knew that it was coming out, we released the technical content, the press articles, um, and we started working with um, our, what we call RCM, our release management team, uh, to push these errata out to our customers. Um, and for the most part, we had a lot of it done within the first 24, 48 hours, um, even though we had lost that week. Um, uh, I admit, though, it was a very long embargo period. Uh, but for us, it also meant that we had a very stressful Christmas. Red Hat traditionally has a shutdown period um, for one week, and we get to all relax. Um, I didn't get that last year, <laughs> uh, nor did many of my coworkers, who I admit, I think they worked much harder than I did. I have a lot of respect for en uh, the engineers and other people on our team who got, who did all the hard work so that when it did release early, it was, okay, we can handle this. Um, and so that's kind of how we approach CISO events. And because we had this process, 
we then just rinse and repeat for any of these future events that came along. And we do this multiple times a year. Um, on the if you go to any of the vulnerability articles that I can link in the slides earlier, you can click back one level and you can see all of them that we release over the year where we give high profile information to our customers about what this is and why you should care or how to respond. Also though, because it is open, everyone has access to it, um, not just our customers. It's written for our customers, but everyone gets it. And um, I've already alluded to this. What did it cost Red Hat? Um, a lot of time. We, we spent some time trying to analyze how much it took this past year, and uh, this is the number that we came up with. Um, this is not trivial uh, to do this work. And um, we have a lot of very respectful kernel engineers working, as well as um, virtualization engineers. Um, I've enjoyed my time with Dan and a few others this year, uh, John Masters. And um, <laughs> now I should not say names because I'm going to forget someone. But I, <laughs> I know like at least eight in my head that I want to say straight off, but I'm not going to. Uh, great engineers, I really respect them. And in the end though, uh, we've produced over 50 pieces of articles or artifacts that we've released that um, help our customers and the community at large to understand what this is. At the end of this slide, I have like two slides with a whole bunch of links, um, which will be available to anyone as well. And um, so can, what, did all, what does this all mean for everyone? Well, things changed. Um, you know, this past year, we've had to work on security issues that isn't just in the OS. This is um, hardware issues that all the OS vendors needed to work and coordinate with the hardware vendors. Um, I would say our relationships have improved across the board with every vendor, um, not only Intel or IBM or ARM or Power, um, but also with Microsoft and Google and Amazon and these other large runs, SUSE, uh, <laughs> because they're some great guys as well, and Ubuntu, we've, we as a community of security engineers and kernel engineers have grown, our communications have improved over the past year um, as a result of this. Um, and for me, it's actually one of the best outcomes I've seen um, in that regard. We've gotten better at talking to each other. But, um, so I wanted to say that I didn't have a great slide for it. So this is a kind of what were some of the attack patterns? So how should you care of about this issue? Uh, the uh, for L1TF being the last one out there, this slide was written to that, um, but it, it applies, you know, in the end, you have to look at what do you have on your systems? Where are they deployed? How are you using, um, what are your applications uh, and where is your data? And often with a lot of the, these issues, someone had to have local shell access on the machine already or some level of access on that machine. That it's not a remote attack. Uh, but once they have that access, they could be very quiet about infiltrating data out of you. If they want to take the long game and not get spotted, they c you know, that's probably how they would maybe do it. There's much better ways though to quickly gain um, from a user to a uh, privileged user quite easily. And we see these things, we patch multiple of them every year. Uh, virtual machines, it's more about the escape. The VM could escape to the physical um, host. Um, ideally, you should be having a control over what's going on in your applications. Um, and for the cloud, I will say I have a lot of respect for the cloud vendors, the, the large ones we've worked with over the past year. They have very good responses to these issues, um, but you should be asking your cloud vendor, kind of, am I exposed or what's my exposure to these issues? Uh, so that you understand uh, if you're running things out there in public, uh, how much do you trust the data being leaked or not? Um, and that kind of goes on to the general risks. Now, talking about uh, 
I, you as a s an individual sysadmin um, or application admin or network administrator, uh, when you look at these things, um, you need to spend time assessing what it is, understanding who, what the attack vectors are, and um, looking at the how you have your data structured um, so that you can understand what's your exposure or potential exposure. And if that it does happen, what does it cost you? You know, obviously um, anything that is kind of personal identified information or credit card data that being exposed as a big reputation risk. Um, and for a lot of individuals or for a lot of companies, they are worried about you know, if we were to have a lot of data, do we, um, kind of what's our risk, what's the reputation to our brand? I mean, people buy products because they trust the vendor. If you can't trust the vendor to hold your data securely, uh, will they keep doing business with you? And um, I think that's for a lot of people, what they need to <coughs> kind of think about is who, who, who um, what's my exposure and what do I lose if I have that data lost? And so I'm going to kind of wrap up. Um, this is my last slide. But this, unfortunately, I feel like is a um, new normal. We've had multiple issues over this past year. Uh, this is a brand new area of research for uh, the academics, especially. Uh, you have to be fairly well, very technical, um, have lost time and a lot of motivation to want to spend time investigating these issues. Um, but uh, we've had some very good conversations over the last year with those um, academic researchers and security researchers about what they're doing and where they're looking. <coughs> um, and these problems are hard to fix. They're, um, they, they're not easy, they're not trivial, uh, because it's hardware plus software combination uh, requires a lot of good communication to happen. And uh, Red Hat, um, as I alluded to earlier, we keep working with the industry uh, to ensure that there's a smooth resolution to issues and that we keep not only our customers, but also the community at large. Um, it's very much a upstream first methodology and we've got to make sure that the fixes are applied very well in the kernel and then we can work on backporting them uh, to like you know, 10 year old the kernels that sometimes no one else is using, but a few select um, um, peer industry vendors as well. And uh, we continue to work uh, to contribute upstream. We are focused though, as myself, a team, is to ensure that we provide um, clear advice to our customers, to the community, to anyone who wants to um, know how to respond to these issues going forward. Or uh, what is the exposure and how they can um, correct it. So, yeah, new normal, unfortunately. Lots to happen, but try not to panic. It's not that bad. Just got a patch. <laughs> and with that, I am going to say questions and uh, see if there's any questions out there. C I can talk on almost any topic. Uh, except for Emacs, I'm not an Emacs user. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Of course, with these lights, I can't see things. Uh, okay, first off, as um, at least in my previous role, uh, a Red Hat customer who was receiving these notifications, thank you for your work. It was always good to receive them. They were always clear and comprehensible for some problems which were pretty complex to try and understand. Do you think the press coverage is useful and proportionate to the risks that people are exposed to in this? And is there something we can do to make that better? Pro so is the press coverage proportional? Um, sometimes I think that the press will look to, um, they, will be, they will be very happy if something has a logo and a brand and make a splash about it because uh, they are happy to work on fear, I think, press in general, uh, you know, they want people to click onto their sites to generate the revenue. So if there's something that new and scary sounding, they're going to talk about it. 
even if the article then says it's nothing to worry about. I've seen some great articles over the last year where uh, they go, oh, boo, 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 and they say, yeah, but really, not to worry about. And Red Hat says this, and you know, go back to sleep, maybe. Um, but yeah, so the branding aspect is something that has changed the industry over the last few years. Um, and I think the press are happy to respond to that. So I don't blame them, but I think that's why in the end, I like to say that if you need to find out how does it impact you for our customers, come to us and let's give you a proportional response. Uh, let's do just one more question for the sake of time here. Okay, I have no idea what the time was. Do you think simultaneous multi-threading is still a viable solution hardware considering this week actually there was also that port smash reported while yeah. they are not di di directly related to Meltdown Spectre, which is to do with the cache, it's looking, at least from my point of view, is m not very educated on it, uh, that simultaneous multi-threading, or as some know it as a hyper-threading, is, while useful in processing, becoming increasingly also a risk in hardware. Um, okay, so I will admit that I work for Red Hat. Um, I have lots of hardware vendors, partners, so my response is going to be proportional. Um, and I think that I know I've seen uh, like OpenBSD take a very uh, strong stance against hyperthreading. Um, we are not taking that stance. We are trying to provide our customers with a clear explanation of what these issues are and how they can impact them and what type of scenarios they may or may not be concerned with. Um, and I think that's best I can say right now. All right, how about one more round of applause for our great speaker here? Uh, thank you. So it's now.